Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Professor Barlow Demogradichin of the Armenian Studies Program at Fresno State. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation in the fall 2021 lecture series of the Armenian Studies Program. This evening's presentation is supported through the efforts of the Clara Busian Bedrosian Fund here at Fresno State. So uh, that through that fund, we're able to help support such lectures as, as we're, we're doing. Uh, this evening, before we, I introduce our, our guest and before we talk a little bit about our presentation, I'd like to uh, share the screen with you to talk to you about two of our upcoming events uh, through the Armenian Studies Program. The first will be uh, our next lecture in our series, which will actually take place on Saturday, October the 30th. And our guest speaker will be Dr. Umit Kurt, who is a Polonsky Fellow at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. And Dr. Kurt uh, will be giving a talk about his newly published book, which is called The Armenians of Eintab, The Economics of Genocide in an Ottoman Province. And that will be uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, California time, one o'clock on the East Coast. Uh, and you need to, again, register through Zoom to join us for that uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Kurt was our Kazan visiting professor a few years ago and has been very active in the Armenian Studies program with his visits and with his lectures. Following that, we're going to have the third, the third in our series of lectures uh, by Dr. Suren Manukyan, who is the Kazan visiting professor in Armenian studies. He'll be giving the third in his three-part series of talks on the Armenian genocide. And this one is go going to be called The Ordinary Killers of the Armenian Genocide, The Lower Level Perpetrators. And uh, Dr. Manukian gave two previous lectures, one on September 17th and the other just last week about the uh, top level uh, organizers, the perpetrators, the architects. And then the second lecture was about the bureaucrats and the following, the third one will be on Friday, November the 12th at 7 p.m. And that will be the ordinary killers of the Armenian genocide. Now you can follow us on Facebook to uh, be able to uh, see our upcoming events, or you can go to the Armenian Studies Program website uh, where you can always find the links to, to all of the events that we are, uh, we are doing. So I'd like to introduce tonight our, our guest speaker. He's Simon Magakian. He's a Denver-based political scientist, human rights advocate, and investigative researcher. Uh, he has advocacy and public service tenure includes serving as Amnesty International USA's primary specialist and campaigner for the ex-USSR. And he was leading the Armenian National Committee of America's community development in 18 Western states. And he manages, uh, he was managing a civic ed education at the Colorado legislature. And he coordinates a very interesting website called Save Armenian uh, Monuments. It's a very important uh, website. And I'll, I'll share that link with you in just a few moments. His academic experience includes lecturing in international relations at the University of Colorado, Denver, and serving in a newly appointed capacity as a visiting scholar at Tufts University. He is currently a PhD student in international heritage at Cranfield University. Uh, and he is, he is a widely uh, cited investigative work has appeared in uh, newspapers and online uh, materials such as hyperallergetic and also hyperallergic the art newspaper, Newsweek, and other outlets. He was recently in Armenia, where he was uh, speaking at the International Religious Freedom and Peace Conference uh, held at Holy Etchmiadzin, where he spoke on the topic of preventing cultural genocide in Artsakh through religious freedom. So tonight he will be speaking about lessons from Nachichivan, assessing the threat to heritage in Nagorno-Karabakh. So I just mentioned uh, at the beginning of this presentation, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions through the chat format of, uh, of Zoom. So please do so during the, the meeting or at the conclusion of his presentation when I'll ask again for questions and we'll have that opportunity. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Simon Magak. And welcome, Simon. Thank you, Professor Dermogradician for the introduction and the invitation. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to talk about a tough subject, but one that has to be discussed over and over again, not only in documentation, but also learning lessons about what has happened in other Armenian territories under Azerbaijan's control, what might happen and what we can do about it. So I'm going to start talking about lessons from Nakhijavan assessing the threat to heritage in Nagorno-Karabakh. 
what we're talking about today, when we talk about the cultural monuments that are at risk, we're talking about those monuments that are under Azerbaijan's control following the 2020 war over Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, as Armenians call the region. Many monuments are now under Azerbaijan's control, as you can see on the screen. Caucasus Heritage Watch, based at Cornell and Purdue Universities, has a satellite monitoring project that looks at uh, over 200 um, um, some sites that are under Azerbaijan's control. There are over a thousand, close to 1,500 sites that are now under Azerbaijan's control, and there is a grave risk to their existence, not just right now, but in the near future. And that's why I'm going to talk about what I've learned through my research over the past 15 years. But let's review what we'll talk about today in more detail. We will look at what happened in Nakhijavan, but not just talk about the what and the who and when, but also, and perhaps most importantly, the why. We also will talk about what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, and again, the why. What can we anticipate and how can an Akhijavan scenario be hopefully prevented. I'll start with this image of three men celebrating the unveiling of a historical Turkic hero in a city called Nakhijavan in 1999. Every person is the hero of their own narrative. This is true for individuals. This is true for states. Almost every state sanitizes its, its history. And no one is perfect when it comes to preservation or being completely honest about some inconvenient chapters in one's history. But we're not talking about imperfection today. We are going to talk about deliberate state-sponsored cultural wipeout followed by systematic denial and cover-up. And when this statue was unveiled in 1999 by the three men pictured here, it was happening in correlation with an ongoing destruction of Armenian monuments that had started just two years earlier. In some ways, this was a celebration of the nearly complete wipeout of all of the historical Armenian monuments in Nakhijavan. The most visible ones had been destroyed by 1999. But the final destruction, about which so many are aware, started in December 2005 at Julfa or Jura, the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery, where over 100 armed Azerbaijanis were deployed in late December of 2005 to wipe out centuries of history, the world's largest collection of medieval Khachkar, the most unique forms of Armenian identity. We know this happened because Armenians and others from across the Iranian border could witness it. I was 19 at the time, about the age of the soldiers who were deployed to wipe out Armenia's history. The Armenian government's response was muted. The Armenian academia was either uninterested or unable to tell the story to the world. The world was silent and Azerbaijan was denying. And so I kind of adopted this as my cause to talk about this, to document it, to raise awareness. One of the things I managed to do in 2009 when I worked at Amnesty International was to convince the American Association for the Advancement of Science to deploy its new program called Science for Human Rights that utilized geospatial or, or satellite technology to monitor cultural destruction. This was the very first international satellite investigation into cultural destruction. And they looked at what had survived of Julfa in 2003 that you can see on the upper side of the screen and 2009, just a few years after it had been erased. A close-up showed a complete wipeout of Julfa Cemetery as we already knew, same in this one. And just recently, Last year, Azerbaijan further desecrated the site, adding a Turkish military style slogan that says everything for the homeland. 
Here are the sources I've used throughout the years to document the destruction of Nahki Javan's Armenian past. We already briefly talked about geospatial data, satellite technology, we'll look more into that. But there's also eyewitness testimony, visual crowdsourcing, state decrees and publications. In the satellite imagery, some of the things are available online in open source documents and technologies like Google Earth that you can download for free, the pro version. If you go there, you search Kerna, you will find a mystical monument, mostly ruined, but still standing tall as late as 2001, that had disappeared just years later. This was actually, according to some Azerbaijanis, a Mongol tomb. According to many Armenian scholars, this was the Holy Mother of God Catholic Cathedral of Kerna when the Catholics established in this area in the 14th century. The destruction that took place in Nahijavan was so severe, so meticulous, that even monuments that might have been Armenian churches were wiped out. Funny and sad enough, if you look up the Nakhijavani tourist websites today, you will find Kerna Temple listed as a tourist attraction featuring old photos. That's because Azerbaijan's government was convinced by Azerbaijani scholars that they had made a mistake by destroying what they thought was a Mongol tomb. They said, you should not have trusted the Armenians. That was not an Armenian monument. Now, when you want to really dig deeper, you have to use some resources that are not easily available. And that's what I did recently for a piece in the art newspaper, where I looked at declassified Cold War era imagery to document the Armenian churches of the most historic town of Nahijavan, Agulis, from where hails the famous Azerbaijani writer Akram Ailisli. He now lives under house arrest for writing a novel about the churches and history of his hometown that are forever gone. This is the satellite that the Americans used against the Soviet Union to document them in the 70s. It was funny enough called the Corona program, but officially hexagon cage, nine mission, and many other names. We looked at Agulis with help from Caucasus Heritage Watch and also help from research on Armenian architecture that provided a Soviet era map by the Soviet military that also detailed the terrain of Agulis. We compared it to the declassified US imagery and identified the churches. The most famous church in Agulis was Subtoman St. Thomas. You can see here that it was destroyed and then replaced with a mosque. Now, this destruction happened from 1997 to 2006. The dates are slightly different here because we're looking at Soviet era imagery. And we'll talk about the dates in some more detail later on. But the way that we know that the destruction started sometime in early June or late May 1997, it's because Akram Ailisli witnessed the destruction of Agulis of churches and Armenian cemeteries. He sent a telegram to the president of Azerbaijan and only recently publicized that telegram. And Sarah Pickman, my co-author of the famous hyperallergic report, and I publicized the English version for the first time in 2019. Other images are Surpas Fatsatsin Monastery, Holy Mother of God, up in the mountains of Agulis. This actually is probably the only monument, the rubbles of which survived to some degree. It's high up in the mountains, so they were not completely able to flatten the entire terrain. So even in the destroyed view, you can still see the outline of the monastic complex. Sub Christophor Church in Agulis, like every stone of Armenian heritage, wiped out, flattened, not even its dust remains. If you had read the 17th century memoir of Zakaria Aguletsi, the merchant from Aguris, Zachary, he talks about the renovation of this church 
and he had actually commissioned a carving of an image of the Holy Mother and Son that was also featured here. One of the many, many photographs done by the legendary researcher Argam Ayvazian, who spent his lifetime documenting the churches and Armenian sites of and all other sites of Nahi Javan. Surpovana Sinagulis, another major site, also completely wipe out, wiped out, along with it, the famous tomb, the unmarked tomb of priest Andreas, who in the early 17th century saved Armenian children from sexual slavery. These were his school kids who were being looked at by the visiting Shah Abbas. He had shaved off their heads. So the kids would look unattractive. And the Shah figured out what was going on, had him tortured and killed. The Armenians buried him here, but never dared to engrave it with his name. Now, Azerbaijan's government keeps denying this destruction, saying it never happened. And although in several phases of my last 15 years of journey of documenting this, sometimes I think I'm done. And then often I start digging it even deeper, especially every time Azerbaijan denies or tries to dismiss my work. I've not publicized this one yet, but further documentation of the Armenian sacred sites, this one in the US War and Navy Department published before World War II, not only mentioning the locations of Armenian churches, but in some instances like here in the village of Abragunis, even mentioning the name in Eastern Armenian spelling in Latin lettering, Surp Karapet, holy precursor. This is what Stephen Sim, a researcher from Scotland, saw on the sacred terrain when he managed to sneak into Nahi Javan in 2005. There was nothing left. When Argam Ayvazian photographed it in the 70s, of course he had damages, but it was still largely intact. During my research, which I call the crowdsourcing one, because we talk about the eyewitnesses like Stephen Sim or Nishan Topuzian, who was Iran's, North Iran's Armenian bishop who witnessed the destruction of Jufa or Akram Ailisi, they are the eyewitnesses. But we also have visual crowdsourcing materials available online that are most of the time published unintentionally that document the same sites where Armenian monuments existed, including this one taken a European traveler who allowed me to use this photo without mentioning his name because he hopes to visit the region again, maybe someday in the future. He had no idea what was he doing when he photographed the mosque that had replaced Sulp Karapet. But he said he felt something was weird. And I want to clarify that the monuments were not destroyed to make room for mosques. There's only a few examples where mosques were built in lieu of churches. Most of the time, the, the spots, the plots remain empty. And I also want to emphasize that this destruction that again started in 1997, sometime in maybe May or so, was not limited to Julfa or Jura. It was all over Nahi Javan. Here are some of the main Armenian sites that existed in the area. Argam Ayvazian, in his survey of the monuments, his field research in 1964 to 1987, enumerated 89 standing churches. By standing, we mean churches that were either almost completely intact or had some recognizable structure. He enumerated 5,840 cross stones and over 22,000 flat tombstones. The remaining data that we have looked at shows that nothing remains from either of those numbers. And we're not talking about a Turkey style destruction in Western Armenia or Eastern Turkey, where you sometimes have ruins heavily vandalized and, and, and um, looted churches, oftentimes flattened, but not all the time. We're talking about complete flattening of history, which continues to this day. This is what Azerbaijan's ambassador wrote in response to my satellite investigation in the art newspaper. 
We need to make it clear that there's no such thing as Armenian heritage in the Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic because Armenians never lived there. Primary academic research on the history of the region would testify to this non-existing sites or cemeteries cannot be destroyed. You may have read this, or if you were following the recent International Court of Justice hearings in which Armenia and Azerbaijan are suing each other for racial discrimination, in truth, Azerbaijan's lawsuit being a mirror lawsuit that was filed in response to the Armenian lawsuit, this was cited as an example of racial discrimination in the court case, which will continue probably through years unless there is some emergency decisions made in the meantime. Now, interestingly enough, Azerbaijan's own government publications, the government decrees document the destruction of the Armenian monuments. This decree was published and signed on December 6, 2005 by Vasif Talibov, the de facto autocrat in Nakhichevan who serves at the pleasure of Azerbaijan's dictator and has been the longtime ruler there. In here, he's giving academics an order to investigate all monuments on the territory of Nakhichevan for the purpose of passportization, which is a Soviet term meaning a survey, um, if necessary, excavation of a monument, a report, and a certification of them and inventorization. So that's what's called passportization. And in here it says, we're doing this to prove that the land of Nakhchivan has always been Azerbaijani Turkic. Some have pointed out that Azerbaijan isn't just denying and destroying the Armenian heritage of Nakhichevan, they're also destroying the diverse Islamic heritage that started with the first wave of conquest and occupation by Arabs, later Mongols who were first Buddhists and later converted, and, and many others, including Persians. But while this might be a sanitizing of history, what has been done to Armenian monuments is not an imperfect representation of history or dismissing of others or trying to create a myth. It is really a cultural genocide. And it was targeting Armenians. Now you might say the word Armenian is not in this order, Simon, you cannot use it in proof. Yes, we can look at this as proof because the report summarizing this order was published into a so-called encyclopedia in 2008 in English and in Azerbaijani, in which the brilliant, in case it's not clear, I'm being sarcastic, the brilliant Va Vasiv Talibov openly admitted to the reason behind the decree. They summarized the investigation's results and they say, Armenians demonstrating hostility against us, not only have an injustice land claim, unjust land claim, but also historical monuments by giving biased and extra S information to the international community. The held investigations once again prove that the land of Nakhchivan belonged to the Azerbaijani Turks and their forefathers, et cetera, et cetera. So they're making clear what this investi what this destruction was, how it was done through the document that was issued on December 6, 2005. So let's talk about the motivations for the erasure that took place in Nakhichevan. A lot of times people will say it was revenge, and this is typically outsiders who look at the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict, look at what happened in the first war in which Armenians won and majority of refugees were Azerbaijanis. Azerbaijanis had you know, lost in absolute numbers more than Armenians had, although percentage-wise as a part of their population, there were more Armenian refugees. But Azerbaijanis suffered gravely through this war. And so some saw this as revenge. Others like the Azerbaijani um, historian and analyst um, Arif Yunus, who's now based in the Netherlands, told me that he thinks that this was done as power projection. He told me that when Ilham Aliyev replaced his father as president in 2003, he was struggling with legitimacy. So he adopted his father's anti-Armenian attitude, his father's Armenophobia, and upgraded it, quote, to the levels of Nazi Germany's anti-Semitism, unquote. 
And Arif Yunus told me something else, that this was also a message to the Azerbaijani dissidents. Because while Azerbaijan was destroying everything, it recruited UNESCO, the organization charged with protecting global heritage, to become an indirect participant in this destruction through silence. And not only that, but during uh, especially the service of Irina Bogova, one of the former chiefs of UNESCO, to actually have Azerbaijan's praised as a country of tolerance. Arif Yunus told me nothing projects the power of the Aliyev regime to dissidents, like committing a cultural genocide in Nakhijavan and then showering in international praises of tolerance. Of course, Armenians see it through lens of genocide, through the lens of the attempt to eliminate Armenians from our homeland, to eliminate our past, to go after what's most sacred to us, to ensure that we'll not exist in that region ever again after thousands of years of history. There is some degree of truth to all of those explanations, but I'll also like to propose that there was another move a move by the Azerbaijani government to show sovereignty against its staunch ally, Turkey. This may sound counterproductive, counterintuitive at first, but keep in mind that in 1997, when the destruction started, like Armenia and Russia signed a major military treaty, Turkey and Azerbaijan did the same. This is also a time when Armenians did not sign a peace treaty with Azerbaijan over the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And so Azerbaijan, for whatever reasons, felt compelled to become major allies with Turkey. But at the same time, because Nakhichevan under the 1921 treaties of Moscow and Kars is a Turkish protectorate, Azerbaijan has a very serious and somewhat of a real fear that Turkey may one day annex Nakhijavan. There are many good reasons for them to do it. Nakhijavan has no common border with Azerbaijan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, this destruction, I think, was also done to impress upon Turkey, to show them, you know what? We can actually be worse than you when it comes to wiping out Armenian history. We got this. Yes, we'll be allies, but don't think that you could do a better job in protecting Nakhijavan from Armenians and Iranians and Russians. So what are the lessons from Nakhijavan? First, destruction does not happen overnight. Destruction started in 1997, lasted until late 2006. Who knows, there might have been some other Armenian monuments that were exhumed during excavations a little later on and still destroyed. But the deadline for the destruction in the 2005 order was December 31st, 2006. Next lesson, absence of Armenians at their sacred sites enables the latter's destruction. Even though very few Armenians remained in Nahijavan, about 3,000 up until the collapse of the USSR and the start of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Armenians with much difficulty continued visiting the sacred region, including my father, who went to Jura as a young man. And that's really how I learned about the history of the cemetery. Maybe that's why I cared about it so much more than others. Absence of Armenians at their sacred sites enables the latter's destruction. One of the last Armenians to visit Nakhijavan was Argam Ayvazian. He was actually born there, but moved to Soviet Armenia. He visited in late October, 1987, he did not go back in part because there was attempted violence against him and his fellow Armenian researchers in this last meeting and Armenians were not allowed to go back. So it took about 10 years from the time that the last Armenians visited their sacred sites to when the destruction started. The other lesson is that destruction happens for several reasons. Armenian communities, especially after the losing the last war feel much more vulnerable today. And it's much easier to say, 
that we're dealing with genocidal fascists who want Armenians wiped out, than to try to spend the time and understand the other reasons why destruction happens. So we have to look at this situation and try to analyze it from different lenses as well. The next lesson is that it is possible to prevent destruction. The Armenian government, Armenian academia, we didn't do much. We didn't do anything really to save the monuments. We have to be brutally honest with ourselves. We did not care truly for the preservation. And that included not being truthful about their state. For example, in 2002, during the second wave of the destruction at Jura, most of the monuments had been toppled down, but not completely erased. Yet Armenian researchers would exaggerate this and say, everything has been destroyed. So we stopped really caring. So we have to be very careful when we describe what is going on. And finally, we need to leave no stone unturned in preventing a cultural genocide in Artsakh. And that means being brutally honest about some mistakes that Armenians have made. The city of Akdam, which is now under Azerbaijan's control, was a ghost town. It used to be populated by Azerbaijanis. Yes, of course, all of those lands were historically Armenian lands. But before the First Karabakh War, those areas that had been previously ethnically cleansed of Armenians were completely inhabited. Some, many of the territories outside the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast were populated by Azerbaijanis who lost their homes and whose cities were turned into ghost towns. Now, Armenians treated mosques much better than what Azerbaijanis did to the churches, but there was still neglect. There was still some desecration. Of course, I would have much, much preferred this over the destruction that happened in Nakhijavan. But we need to be honest and say that Armenians could have done a better job in respecting the sacred sites that were under our control and maybe allowing Azerbaijani pilgrims to visit and, and keep contact with their sacred sites. Because that's what Armenians really need to do today to save what remains from Armenia's history. And we'll talk more about that later. Now, the Azerbaijani government lies that out of 67 mosques, 63 were raised to the ground. This is absolutely untrue. Yes, none of the mosques with one exception were renovated, um, but an overwhelming majority of them stood intact. Um, with some natural damage, with some vandalism, but they still stood intact, including this interesting mosque in Efendilej or Aigek, which Azerbaijan's government took control of in this last war. They would publicize its photographs and say that it had been desecrated and demolished. We can see it's still intact. And interestingly enough, this mosque was flattened by Azerbaijan's government after they so-called liberated it during some road construction, most likely mistaken for an Armenian church or another medieval Armenian structure, but flattened by Azerbaijan in recent months as documented by Caucasus Heritage Watch. Now, majority of the mosques with one exception under Armenian control were largely intact. This is a mosque in Fizuli that was almost completely destroyed. And many Islamic cemeteries were vandalized, but often by individuals. There was no state-sponsored wipeout of the Islamic heritage of Azerbaijan, although we know that oftentimes Armenia will sanitize the Islamic past that has taken place in Armenian history and call it Persian and not acknowledge that those monuments are also part of Azerbaijani heritage, at least by being sacred to Azerbaijanis. And of course, it's important to note that the Armenian authorities also renovated one of the mo mosques in Shushi that is now under Azerbaijan's control. So the motivation for desecrating Islamic monuments were 
likely revenge, looting, state neglect. But there was no state sponsor wipeout like we saw the case in Nakhijama. And this brings us to what's happening in Artsakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, the areas that are now under Azerbaijan's control today. Here you see Azerbaijan's first lady, who also happens to be the first vice president, looking at Armenian inscriptions, pretending like she's a historian or some sort of a scholar. This is the very same church in the occupied Hadrut region where Azerbaijan's president Ilham Aliyev and his wife went and declared the Armenian inscriptions fake and vowed that those will be restored. But what is it that Azerbaijan is actually doing today? What is the current cultural policy? We all know that the long-term goal is final erasure of Armenians, but actually there's more than that that's going on. I would argue that Azerbaijan is engaged in what I would call a triple speak. It's doing three things. Internationally, it's trying to project coexistence by being restrained in its ongoing destruction of Armenian monuments. Domestically, it's still tapping in the very same Armenophobia that has maintained the current regime. And when it comes to Armenians, it's sending a message of demoralization and compelling the remaining Armenians in Artsakh into self-exile. The perfect example of this is the Ghazan Chetzot's Holy Savior Cathedral in Shushi, which was bombed on October the 8th, 2020 during the war. It was targeted twice, showing that it was, as Human Rights Watch has documented, most likely deliberate war crime. Now, Azerbaijan has been so-called renovating it, although last I heard, you know, even the so-called renovation has taken some sort of a stop. But the way that it's being renovated is doing those three things internationally. They're trying to show they are a responsible player. But domestically and toward the enemy, aka Armenians, they are showing what they intend to do. And that is to turn the cathedral back to what it looked like after the 1920 pogrom and massacre of Shushi that minoritized the city's Armenian majority. So for Armenians, this is another message of demoralization. And interestingly enough, if you read my Asia Times piece in November, I very specifically predicted this restoration, not the decapitation of the uh, umbrella-like conical dome, but the pretend renovation as a tokenization of this cathedral. It meets Azerbaijan's propaganda. According to the government of Azerbaijan, Armenians only showed up in the region in the 19th century after Russians took over the region from Persia and Armenians were a minority not a majority. And this cathedral was built in the late 19th century, so it fits the profile. And they're not rebuilding so-called the other Armenian churches in the area because a minority would only have one church, not more. Now, Caucasus Heritage Watch has been documenting destruction of Armenian cemeteries, like in Medz Tavesh in the occupied Hadrid region, and you can see that a road has been built through the cemetery. So oftentimes the pretext of construction ends up in the in destruction of not just the section where they need to build something. The same thing with the Sarnach Cemetery. And interestingly enough, Azerbaijan's pledge to renovate churches back to their original state, AKA removal of its Armenian identity and Armenian inscriptions. This was even happening during the war in other parts of Azerbaijan. Here is a church used by the Udi minority in Azerbaijan that was so-called renovated during the last war. And the renovation resulted in the elimination of the Armenian inscription, or at least its cover up and the elimination of the image of Holy Echmiadzin, the Armenian Holy See. Now, while having destroyed everything in Nakhijavan and while 
attempting to destroy as much as it can in, in Nagorno-Karabakh today, although keeping in mind that they are trying to impress upon the international community of being tolerant. And the main reason for that is to incentivize the removal of Russian peacekeepers in four years so that the final ethnic cleansing of Armenians can become so much easier. Despite that, Azerbaijan still uses the Albanian Caucasian propaganda to claim that the Armenian monuments of Nagorno-Karabakh are not Armenian. You can see some of them featured on Azerbaijani official stamps. One might say this is much more preferable to destruction. So what if they're going to be relabeled? Well, that's not really true because albanization is not a long-term policy. It's a first step in the eventual destruction. Why do I say this? Because of the lessons from Naki Javan. Here is the Soviet Azerbaijani encyclopedia in Cyrillic script in Azerbaijani, talking about Agulis, its Armenian churches, even mentioning how a Turkic Iranian Shah sponsored the renovation of the main cathedral, the main monastic complex of Agulis in Azerbaijan's own historiography. Yet despite this, and despite decades of albanizing the Armenian churches of Nakhijevan to such degree that almost the majority of locals started believing that the monuments in Nakhijevan were indeed Caucasian, Albanian, and Armenian, despite all of that, the monuments were still destroyed. So albanization is not even a long-term solution if only we cared for the physical preservation. And during the Soviet era, Azerbaijan actually renovated this Armenian church that's now under Azerbaijan's control, Van Kasar, a seventh century church next to the Granaker. And when they did, they also albanized it by removing its Armenian inscriptions. This is one of the best known churches that is now under Azerbaijan's control, along with the famous Tadivang that has Russian peacekeepers, but Armenian pilgrims are no longer allowed. It has hundreds of inscriptions in Armenian that Azerbaijan is going to do everything to polish out. And we have Tsitsarnavang, the fifth or fourth century uh, basilica, the best preserved basilica, one of the best preserved early Armenian churches in the region. And the newly discovered ruins of Tigranaker, the Hellenistic Armenian city that also developed in the last, in the latter centuries, including in the early Christian era. So what is it that can be done applying the lessons of Nahi Javan? And to be honest, for me, the most important lesson from what happened in Nahi Javan is that when Armenians stop visiting their sacred sites, those sites are much more likely to be destroyed. And a positive example of the opposite is a cathedral in northwestern Iran dedicated to an apostle known as a black church locally where Armenians each year have an annual pilgrimage in July. The Iranian government restores it and actually not only applied for the monument but also for the act of the pilgrimage to be enlisted as UNESCO heritage sites and activities respectively. Now, this may sound like an impossible scenario where we can have pilgrimages to Armenian churches under Azerbaijan's control. But despite the destruction that has happened throughout Eastern Turkey or Western Armenia, some remnants of Armenian sacred sites survive in Turkey often because of pilgrims and Armenian tourists. Here you see remnants of the famous Varagavank Cathedral in the Van region. To the left, you have the Kurdish family that owns the keys to manage the sacred site. And to the right, you have an Armenian tour director who made a deal with the family that he'll be, bring tourists and pilgrims so long as they preserve the monument. And in return, the family will earn some money. Armenian pilgrims in Ahtamar, in Van, in Turkey, have not only contributed in some ways to its 
continue you know, uh, restoration, although some might, might argue it was a propaganda move by the Turkish government, they've also taught local vendors how to correctly spell Aftamar. In fact, you know, I wish they would have done the same with the Armenian cognac. It still misspells it. But in Turkey, the misspelling is not an Armenian misspelling. It's a converted name to have a Turkish meaning. But we can see that Armenian contact can have a positive impact. What I'm suggesting is not a perfect solution to say the very least. These are very hard times. Armenians have suffered, they're witnessing their heritage being erased one more time. But we also have to remember that every targeted group has an agency in what happens to them, in what happens to their culture. And there should be no stone unturned in the process of fighting for the preservation of Armenian sites. It might not be an ideal situation that many may chose not to go visit Armenian sites under Azerbaijan's control. But if many others don't, the alternative is a flattening, a literal cultured cancel of our history, just like the empty field you see here, as I saw it when I took this photo in 2013 across from Iran, looking into where the world's largest medieval Armenian cemetery used to be. So I'll conclude today's presentation by saying that the most important lesson from Naki Javan is that the targeted group has an agency in this process and that individuals and communities can play a role in preservation, in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'm going to uh, place in the uh, chat uh, the website that uh, Simon has uh, developed. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the, the website and uh, who's done the work on it maybe and, and a little bit of what you're doing with that. Save uh, SaveArmenianMonuments.com. Yes, um, so that's actually, I wouldn't call it my website. It's the website of a new initiative called Save Armenian Monuments out of New York that looks at different ways of finding solutions to saving what remains of Armenian culture under, under control of you know, our, our neighbors of Armenia, especially Azerbaijan. And actually the idea of a pilgrimage to asserting the right of having presence at sacred sites uh, is is one that Save Armenian Monuments believes in. And one of the many activities that they have, including education among children through puzzles and whatnot, is attempting pilgrimages to Armenian sites that are no longer under the control of Armenians. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna invite our, our guests uh, in the audience to go ahead and write their questions in the chat. And while you're doing that, uh, I'll just go ahead and ask a first question, and then uh, we'll start reading some of the questions that are gonna be in the chat. Uh, you did mention about uh, the agency of the the, the people th that are being the targeted of the cultural monuments. Mm. But I know that recently, since uh, since the the Karabakh War of 2020, there's been a a large sort of effort on the part of Armenian scholars now that are now kind of activated to work with international bodies. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a brief evaluation of. Your, your take on uh, how international bodies see this destruction and is there any response? And I'm thinking like United Nations or um, other bodies, maybe you can just mention a couple and give a couple of examples of, of what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't had any promising, any positive signs so far. I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly more optimistic when it comes to the current case before the International Court of Justice in which they are actually asking that Azerbaijan be directed to engage Armenians in the renovation of uh, Shushi's cathedral and make sure that it's not being rebuilt back to the pogrom look of 1920, but it's actually being respectfully renovated. I also hope, and this is being awfully optimistic, that also the court might consider 
requiring some sort of pilgrimage access to the sites that are under um, Azerbaijan's control. UNESCO has had a really bad record on this issue, but we also have to keep in mind that most international organizations are made of state actors that are interstate bodies that make decisions. You know, they're not um, some, some powerful police forces that can just come in and, and do what they want unless there is a mandate from the UN Security Council, which is the only international organization that can have a mandate and allow for its enforcement and actually come through the, with, with that pledge. UNESCO has said recently that it wishes to have monitoring. The current leadership is more promising and hopeful than the ones prior to that. So perhaps there is some hope uh, for, for international monitoring. Of course, there's also hope that the Russian peacekeepers under advocacy from the local Armenian diocese and others might convince the Azerbaijanis to have more pilgrimages, not just to Darivank, which was the only pilgrimage allowed, but also to Tsitsernavang, Gatichevang, uh, and Vankasar, which are now under Azerbaijan's control. And the Russian Orthodox Patriarch, as some of you may have seen last week, hosted the Armenian Catholicos and the Azerbaijani Sheikh ul Islam for a dialogue on this issue. Uh, some of the scholars involved in this process, as you know, Dr. Uh, Professor Dermakardichian, have been advocating that there be some communication between the religious leaders. And, you know, some of us have said that maybe there needs to be a discussion about having some mutual pilgrimages or some mutual monitoring of sacred sites that would allow for the preservation of, of those holy places and cultural monuments. There's not too much hope from international organizations. And I think it's important to emphasize the role no matter how small individuals and communities can play in the preservation by ensuring their presence. And of course, there is a large group of scholars that you know, are working together. You, know, you and I serve as part of the uh, Diocese Heritage, Edgemiats and Heritage Committee, uh, where th there's a lot of scholars involved, uh, including Professor Laporta. I think he's uh, also uh, uh, joining us here. Um, there is other others working on a variety aspects of this. I also think it's important to engage moderate Azerbaijani voices on this issue. Azerbaijani scholars who are independent of the government propaganda who can also play a, a, some some positive role in, in in this process. But this is a real dangerous situation that we're that we're facing. And my take is that we should do anything and everything possible to to save whatever we can. Thank you, and remember uh, to our audience, you can ask questions in the uh, chat function. There is a question, uh, it's kind of two parts. How come the Iranian government couldn't stop the Azeris from destroying the churches and monuments in Julcha? And then a uh, corollary was, were the Azeris who did dis the destruction from Azerbaijan or Iran? So the the destruction of Julcha, it's an international territory of Azerbaijan. There's a a border, there's a fence, and the natural border, which is the river Araxes or Arax, that separates Iran from Azerbaijan. So, I mean, physically, if Iran's government wanted to, they, they, you know, they could, I guess, start shooting Azerbaijani soldiers, but then they would be, you know, uh, in, in engaging in aggression and, and start a war. So I, I, I don't think they would consider that. Um, Azeris, ethnic Azeris from Iran and ethnic Azeris in Azerbaijan and ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and in Armenia as individuals might have participated in cultural destruction of what they see as the enemy. But the destruction that I have investigated that I am talking about has been conducted by the government of Azerbaijan through its military, and oftentimes not supported by the local Azerbaijani population in Nakhijavan for a variety of reasons, including the propaganda that these people grew up with that those monuments were Caucasian Albanian monuments, not Armenian monuments. So we're not talking about individuals or um, communities engaged in 
vandalism, we are talking about a state apparatus engaging and employing and deploying its military and its resources to wipe out a culture. And with, with very few parallels in history or in modern times, I mean, China to some degree is engaged in this in Xinjiang and you know in the Uyghur or Uruz areas where Turkic people live um, and, and other uh, state or state-like actors like ISIS have done this to terrorize local populations. We know the Taliban have done this, but oftentimes those things have been done to project power or for, for some you know, reason to have an impact on the local population. No Armenians live in Nahijavan anymore. So it was not only, it wasn't done just to demoralize Armenians. There were more reasons behind it. And it was the state. And to, to sh share another example of why this wasn't done by people, but by the government, Azerbaijan's government was also destroying tea houses in Nakhijavan in 2005, Chaykhanas, to prevent any sort of societal discussion of problems in Nakhijavan. Um, and they now only have a few government controlled Chaykhanas that exist in, in that ex-slave. Thank you. And again, you can ask your questions. I want to follow up. You, you briefly mentioned uh, the court case that's currently at the International uh, Court, World Court. Could you just elaborate briefly what the Armenian case is and what they seek? What is the, what is the correction that they seek uh, from the Azeris? So they're asking for emergency decisions by the court that would come out right away, maybe as early as next week, directing Azerbaijan to do mainly three things. One, close down the military trophy park in Baku that demonizes Armenians through mannequins that have, you know, um, like Nazi-like portraiture of, of the enemy. Uh, second, they're asking for the immediate release of Armenian POWs, be, given the discrimination against Armenians in Azerbaijan that typically ends in imminent uh, death and, and torture. And third, they're asking for um, protection of Armenian churches, given what happened in, in, in Nakhijavan. Um, so three primary things from what I understand, and Azerbaijan in turn is asking uh, for uh, landmine maps uh, in the region and for the closure of what they classify as sort of private militant organizations in Armenia that are training people for, you know, potential war. Okay, there's another question, um, and it starts with a, a, a little preface. Raphael Lemkin's concern about cultural genocide was not only the immediate impact on the targeted victim community, but also the loss of important diversity for the global community. Do we have any indications of the world's concerns over such vandalism? Interestingly, Lemkin suggested two terms, one of which was vandalism before he developed the concept of genocide. So the question about, do we have indications of the world's concern over such uh, vandalism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a great um, question. And if Lemkin had its way, cultural genocide would be a main feature of the International Genocide Convention. As we know, it's not. It got taken out and despite his best efforts, he could not include culture as, as part of that. As the um, uh, question writes, you know, at first genocide was defined as crimes of vandalism and barbarity, bar barbarity referring to um, cruelties against civilians and vandalism talking about the targeting of cultural monuments. Unfortunately, we have not seen a revival of this sort of thinking in recent decades. Uh, with some exceptions. Uh, right now, organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch talk about ESCR, economic, social, and cultural rights, or group rights, if you will, as um, fundamental human rights that are in need of protection. So kind of moving from the Western concept of individual right to more like group right. And so cultural protection um, has you know, received somewhat more attention, but not to the degree that we would like to see. And to this day, a lot of the protection mechanism in place are for wartime situations because there is not much precedence except with what happened in Nakhichevan and what's happening in China today against the Uyghur people uh, in terms of like a peacetime complete wipeout of, of their cultural monuments. Although China's example is, is slightly different, the 
um, they're not completely wiping out everything, but the, the, the complete flattening of sacred sites, it's, it's very much like what, what Azerbaijan did. So I wish there was more, more interest, but there is not. And oftentimes, you know, I hear the opposite, you know, I get criticized, well, you know, why are you so um, engaged in the subject? You know, why isn't a uh, humanitarian catastrophe more important like POWs or refugees? I mean, we have neglected, and, and it's a true criticism. Um, um, you know, we have neglected the, the 40 permanently displaced, well, hopefully not permanently, but effectively permanently displaced refugees, especially from the Hadrut region, from, from Shushi. And, you know, there's probably been more discussion about cultural monuments than, than anything else. I'm happy to share the knowledge I've, I've gathered through the years, but it's certainly not the only uh, issue that, that needs um, coverage. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with you. I had a question. Um, you, you talked about some of the, the people that are now involved in, you know, monitoring what's happening, what's happening uh, mm -hmm. in Azerbaijan and the lessons from Nakhichevan. My question to you is, can you evaluate and give us a, a brief evaluation of where you see today's Armenian government or today's Karabakh government on this specific issue of the of the cultural heritage? Are they are they making efforts to to bring this to the world's attention? Are they using their diplomatic, you know, powers, let's say, to, to also, there's many issues, of course, but are they, is this one of them? Is this on their agenda? It, it depends what we consider Armenian government. If, if we are judging the Armenian government's actions, like through the court case before ICJ, we, we will have to say it's doing an excellent job um, because, you know, they, they really made the best case they could for, for this issue, of course, heavily relying on uh, my work and the work of, of others to, to document what has happened. But, you know, if we're talking about the, the wartime measures, not just the losing of the war, but the organizing of evacuation of monuments and protection, I mean, that was a disaster and there is nothing really positive that can be said about government actions from the information that we know. In terms of looking in the future, uh, uh, it's, you know, the Armenian government has been very opaque about what exactly it's negotiating, what uh, what are the conditions that Azerbaijan is bringing up. So it, it would be hard to tell. But overall, uh, I would say that all Armenian governments have miserably failed, uh, especially the Kocharyan and Sarkisyan. Uh, uh, actually, the Kocharyan administration, mostly, you know, the blame has to go to him because it's just, the destruction in Nakhichevan happened under his watch and nothing major was pursued at the time to stop the destruction. I mean, um, you know, there were so many sacred Azerbaijani sites under Armenian control at the time, you know, you know, why could they not have offered mutual pilgrimages to, to sacred sites, for example, to, to stop the destruction. Um, I don't have much from the current administration, don't have much hope, if any hope from the current administration in Armenia, um, however, even some of its critics say that, you know, let's say there's opening of borders and whatnot, you know, one of the few good things that might come out of it is actually that the army monuments will not be completely destroyed because we'll have access to them. When it comes to the authorities in Nagorno-Karabakh, they have, you know, so much less agency in this, except for two things. One is advocating the Russian peacekeepers for access. And, you know, this is probably done more by the local army and diocese than the government. But one thing that we can give credit to uh, the authorities in Stepanaker uh, is engaging in community archaeology in the areas that are still under Armenian and Russian peacekeeping control, cleaning up whatever monuments are left, going to remote areas, to churches, to cemeteries. And actually Save Armenian Monuments is a partner in, in that process through our local liaison, uh, uh, Marina Lazaridou, a Greek-Armenian who lives in Armenia and frequently travels to Artsakh to, to help out with those, with those initiatives. Um, so it's, it's a mixed evaluation, but I, I know, you know the easiest thing to do is expect the state and the international organizations, you know, because they're considered the most important actors, right? The states to address those questions. But I think it's, it's important to come back to the question of what individuals and communities can also do, because it's so much easier to sit back and criticize um, not just the Armenian government, the Azerbaijani government. I mean, you know, we we oftentimes will just 
you know, portray the Azerbaijani and Turkish government as genocidal fascists. And there's a lot of truth to that, but how does it help to not try to proactively do something to protect the monuments? It's much easier to wait for their destruction and mourn and feel, you know, self-righteous about another suffering that we're going through. Uh, we, we need to make that an unacceptable reaction uh, in, in our in Armenian communities. So tonight's uh, presentation and all of the Armenian Studies program presentations are archived uh, at, at YouTube. I just sent the link to everyone in the uh, chat. And if you'd like to share that with uh, your friends and families to watch uh, this after the fact, uh, we welcome you to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Simon Malakian, for a very fascinating and uh, interesting look into the lessons from Nakhichevan and, and what's happening today with the heritage in the Gorno karabakh Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation. And thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you at our next events. And thank you for joining us this evening. Good